direct from Moscow to Washington comes a transport bearing an insignia of Soviet-American goodwill. Aboard is China's premier, Dr. T.V. Sung, Arriving from conferences which led to a new friendship treaty between Russia and China, Dr. Sung has come to talk with President Truman and Secretary of State James F. Burns. The long war against the Axis is ended. United Nations leaders plan for the era of peace ahead. Radar. Miracle weapon of World War II. Two United States Navy civilian scientists, Dr. A. Hoyt Taylor, chief of electronics research, and his assistant, Leo C. Young, contributed to its development. Fifty years of worldwide research in radio and television, plus the basic discoveries of these men, went into the cathode ray tube, the heart of radar, which measures time in millionths of a second and translates those measurements into vital military information. In operation, a stream of electrons flows through the cathode ray tube and appears on its fluorescent screen as a visible dot. Voltage variations make this dot move slow or fast. Speed it up, it moves so fast that it appears to trace a single solid line known as the time base. The time that it takes the dot to trace this line is exactly calculated in spotting a target. When the radar antenna sends out its pulses, they bounce back from the unknown target, and the result is seen as a peak on the radar screen. Reading this pattern, the distance and speed of an approaching plane are charted. A radar-equipped airplane on patrol picks up a large ship to its left, then a smaller ship to its right. The peaks on the screen correspond. Broadside, a ship looks larger than it does head on. Nearing land masses, these also are detected. The radar screen does not show actual pictures as in television, but its images are accurately interpreted by trained operators. A Navy scout plane detects the presence of an enemy fleet. The American fleet's guns could destroy these ships from great range without ever actually seeing them. Army anti-aircraft defenses around an industrial center constantly send out radar pulses. Defenses like this helped win the Battle of Britain. Enemy target detected. The pulses echo back. Directional antenna point their beams directly at the enemy. From the receiving antennae, elaborate machines, which are part of a complex warning system, word is flashed to the central control station. From here, searchlight and anti-aircraft batteries get their orders. Clearly followed, even in darkness, the plane comes near. Searchlights snap on. The enemy is pinpointed. Automatically aimed, the guns fire. This development, which greatly reduced the element of total surprise in war, will in peacetime play a vital role in sea and air navigation. The mysteries of shorelines, of harbors, of bad weather can be all but overcome with the aid of instruments which, using one of many types of radar, can actually draw a map of unseen terrain. The fog-bound pilot coming into land was once at the mercy of bad visibility, even with the best radio equipment. Now, through radar-equipped airport control stations, he is brought in safely. The plane loses altitude, danger of a crash. But the control tower, following the plane perfectly, gives warning in time. Instructions go out for a safe landing. Radar, the most revolutionary weapon since the airplane, 
is only eclipsed in its significance for war and peace by the atomic bomb. Like both the plane and the bomb, it is a product of American and allied science. The free world has reason to be thankful for the freedom of its scientific thought. of many nations, American, British, Canadian, and those driven from their homes by Nazi persecution have perfected the atomic bomb, most astounding development of scientific history. At the University of California, in absolute secrecy, Dr. Ernest O. Lawrence experimented with the cyclotron. Such work as his led to the splitting of the uranium atom, force of the atomic bomb. In the center of each atom is a nucleus of protons and neutrons. Around this nucleus revolve electrons, and the number of electrons determines the element. One electron forms hydrogen, two form helium, three electrons form lithium, and so on up to 92 electrons and uranium. For years, scientists have tried to break up this atom by shooting neutrons at its core, but the whirling electrons seemed impenetrable. And then finally, scientists broke through those walls with a slow neutron, releasing 500 million volts of energy and forming two new atoms, barium and krypton. The uranium atom was split, releasing unimaginable force. At Oak Ridge, Tennessee, are two of the giant plants where the atomic bomb is produced. A 59,000-acre military area, a city where 75,000 people worked in absolute secrecy on history's most sensational secret. The first tryout of this new cosmic force was held on the New Mexico desert, only 20 days before it devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki in its first combat tests. It is night. Army cameras six miles away record the historic explosion. This is the end result of years spent on research and production of feverish scientific labors to harness atomic power ahead of the enemy. Luminous smoke rises eight miles in the air. From another angle, still six miles away, another picture of the atomic eruption. The energy that generates the heat of the sun and operates the solar system comes under the will of humankind. The blast changes the atomic structure of everything it hits. Stone and steel are turned into gas. A third view of the same explosion. This incredible energy opens limitless horizons. President Truman speaks on this new force. The atomic bomb is too dangerous to be loose in a lawless world. That is why Great Britain, Canada, and the United States, who have the secret of its production, do not intend to reveal the secret until means have been found to control the bomb so as to protect ourselves and the rest of the world from the danger of total destruction. I shall ask Congress to cooperate to the end that its production and use be controlled and that its power be made an overwhelming influence toward world peace. We must constitute ourselves trustees of this new force to prevent its misuse and to turn it into the channels of service to mankind. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us instead of to our enemies. And we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes.